All right, we back. My expert opinion, the greatest show in the world, 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 Ah, we got something special for y'all today. Mac, what up, bro? How you doing? My shoulder's kind of messed up, so I got to do that. I'm trying to tell you. Ah, you got to yeah. stretch first. Wow. Rest in peace, Young Cheese. Yes. Stop. Rest in peace, Young stop Cheese. Stop it. Philadelphia, stop, stop it. Stop Condolences and prayers go out to Gilly, Gilly Wallow and his whole family. No father should have to bury their child. No son should have to grow up without his father. That is a fact. knock it off. Stop that. Rest in peace. Condolences to the whole family. Can we have a moment, moment of silence? Thank you. Yeah, that's a tough thing. We'll get to that. Um, Sean Bigger. Peace, everyone. Great day. Happy to be alive. God woke me up this morning. Let's do it. Oh, why you got that suit on? <laughs> no one. <laughs> one of us got to represent. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> has to dress like a grown up Somebody. around here. Oh, please. <laughs> uh, uh, Chastity. <laughs> What's up? How you doing? Hi. Half an hour. That's crazy. Jack. Half an hour. That's crazy. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? Come on. Chad, dude, don't how you the, doing, Chad? Don't hit me with the. <laughs> don't hit me with the. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually yeah. feel like it's a boom <laughs> shakalaka. Boom. But everything is good. Everything is great. Happy to be here. Happy to be free. Alive. Just as uh, Bigger said. And everything is moving exponentially as it should. Positive vibes. Positive vibrations. And we're going to keep vibrating. High and higher. So, so. Now, if you are unfamiliar with the man sitting next to Champ, he catches rattlesnakes with his bare hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I have to say. That's all I have to say. And he's also running for president. We, uh, he's uh, a member of a family that America has loved for so long. Um, unfortunately, there's been, you know, a lot of controversy around his family. But he's here to tell his story. So, welcome Robert F. Kennedy. Bare hands! Bare hands! <laughs> Just his phone is about to ah. oh. Oh, yeah. oh man! Yeah, yeah. Put it right here. How you doing, sir? I'm very good. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes. Oh, uh, first coming. question I wanted to ask you: Have you ever been bitten? by one of the rattlesnakes that you catch with your bare head. I've never been bitten by a poison snake, but I've been bitten by a lot of other snakes. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that they were like, <laughs> part of like the process. practice before you got to the, the rattlesnake. You have to master your technique. As a politician, that answer could have a bunch of different meanings to it. Been bitten by a bunch of different other guys. That's I heard. Yeah. 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 Metaphorically, yeah. That's yeah. My yeah. First, that was my first, is, is that so? Wow. Well, that's so, too. I, I've been bitten by literal snakes, too. Yeah. Um, I was with my kids in Ecuador one time on a plantation, or a banana plantation, and there were canals in it, and they were taking the, uh, when they caught the snakes in the canals, they would throw them into a cage, and so there were about 20 or 30 of them in a cage, and I reached in to grab one of them, and a lot of them bit me all at once. Why? Uh, why? 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 <laughs> why? Why? But the, why? But the, you know what? They bite. Uh, these are like little anacondas and boa constrictors. When they bite you, they leave their teeth in you. And, mm. and some of those teeth didn't come out of my hand for over a year. What? Wow. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Did you know that the teeth do that when you reach for the snake? Yeah, I, I did, but I, I hadn't had that experience before. I was surprised about how many of them decided to bite me. At the <laughs> You're <time>. surprised? <laughs> wow. Wow, that's a lot. They were like, it's a Kennedy, get him! <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> now, I wanted to, um, you know, but usually when uh, it's presidential candidates, um, not many people are, are, are versed in who these people are before we see them standing behind a podium telling us things. So I like to start from the beginning. 
Um, your childhood, what, what were your earliest memories like? So I'm one of 11 kids. I'm the third uh, of 11 kids. Um, my father was Robert Kennedy, who was the attorney general. When I was born, <clears throat> he was an attorney, who was, and he was working for my uncle, John Kennedy, who was then a senator. Right. And I was born in 1954, and this was, uh, and my uncle ran for president in 1960. Right. Oh, I, um, and I remember that campaign very well. I went out to Los Angeles for the convention. It was the first time I'd ever stayed up all night. Okay. Um, How old were you? I was, at that time, I was seven. Wow. Mm. Oh, and there's pictures of me in the convention with my brother playing with a snake on the table that I had caught. <laughs> 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 it's been a lifelong thing right here. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So many questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you just got to leave alone. <laughs> so my uncle was attorney general. My father was uh, um, was president, and that you know that was at, at the time at a time when the, the their principal preoccupation was the civil rights movement. They were you know fighting uh, to get uh, James Meredith. They sent twenty thousand troops down to get James Meredith into the University of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Um, they sent troops to Alabama, 16,000 troops to get uh, um, uh, Veronica Malone mm -hmm. into, and five other students into the University of Alabama. They were in a fight with George Wallace, who was a segregationist. He famously vowed segregation now, segregation forever, uh, mm -hmm. as his sort of campaign slogan. And he was their nemesis. Um, and they, uh, and they, you know, they, they got to play an important role in making this country a true constitutional democracy for the first time in its history. I was saying to somebody the other day that I, I was born in Virginia at a time when there was still Jim Crow laws, so it was illegal, for example, for a black man to marry a white woman or vice versa. Right. And I had, we had a groom, a, 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 like a handyman who worked for us, who became very close to me because um, I spent a lot of time out hunting and trapping hawks and other animals. And he would drive me around the state of Virginia. He was a, had been a CB um, in World War II. Mm -hmm. Blacks weren't allowed to fight. Black men were not allowed to fight World War II until the very, very end. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but they, could, they served in the military, but they usually served on construction crews. And he had been in a construction crew in the South Pacific. He was about six foot five extremely intelligent, uh, very articulate, and, um, and dignified. But when we drove around Virginia, I, we, when we stopped for lunch, I would have to go into the diner and buy food for both of us and then come back and eat it in the car together because, uh, because of segregation laws. He one time asked me to buy, to come with him to Solana Village, which is a little shopping uh, area, like a village near where, where, where there was a shoe store. Right. And because he was not allowed in the shoe store. And I had to go in, give, the, give his size to the salesman, and bring out the shoes. And, um, and uh, he tried them on, on the sidewalk. And, and if they didn't fit, he couldn't bring them back. At that time, um, it was very common for black people to have corns because of that problem, because once they tried on the shoe, they could not hand it back. So if it was too tight, and you would see at that time a lot of black people that had cut uh, pieces out of their shoes, you know, to alleviate the pain. Wow. Um, but, you know, my father, my uncle got to play this very important role with Dr. King working with him. They organized together with him the, um, the Civil Rights March in 1963 when he gave his I Have a Dream speech. Um, my father um, then, you know, continued to work with Dr. King after my, my uncle was killed in 63. Um, his, uh, he, had, uh, he, he had been in a, a war with his own CIA and with his intelligence apparatus. And um, he was uh, he was killed in Dallas, assassinated in Dallas in 1963. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, he didn't want to go to the Vietnam War, so he sent his 
his uh, advisors honored him and his intelligence apparatus. He fired the heads of the CIA right as soon as he came, became president because they tricked him into the Bay of Pigs invasion. Mm -hmm. And he knew that they had lied to him. And he came out of a meeting that night and he said, I want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. And he fired Alan Dulles, Richard Bissell, and Charles Cabal, the three top guys of the CIA. But he was surrounded by an intelligence apparatus and military that wanted to go to war, that considered war with the Soviet Union at war with Cuba, both um, inevitable and advisable, wow. desirable. And he didn't want to do that. He sent, they wanted to send 250,000 troops to Vietnam, and he refused. He sent 16,000 advisors. So he never sent a combat troop abroad. He told his best friend, the primary job of the president of the United States is to keep the country out of war. And he refused to send combat troops to Vietnam. He sent uh, Green Berets to advise the Vietnamese. Some of them did fight, which was against the rules of engagement. A month before he died, he asked for a, um, a he heard that one of the Green Berets had been killed and he asked for a casualty report. And his, uh, his aide brought him the report to show that 75 Americans had died. And he said, that's too many, I'm pulling them all out. And he signed that day National Security Order 263, ordering all troops home from Vietnam. Um, with the first thousand coming home in December, this was October. Yeah. A month later, he was killed. And uh, a week after that, Lyndon Johnson remanded that order and then ended up within a year sending 250,000 troops over. It then became an American war. Uh, Nixon, who came in after him, sent in uh, 560,000. Uh, 56,000 never came home, including my cousin, George Skakel, who was killed at the Tet Offensive. Don't my father it. ran against the war in 68, so five years later, against Johnson. It forced Johnson out of the race. So he ran against an incumbent president, the same as I'm now doing in the Democratic Party. It forced Johnson out of the race, and then my father was shot. And um, after winning the California primary, my father was shot uh, in June of 1968, on June 5th, and I was with him when he died. I was 14 years old then, yeah. and I, we flew him back on Vice President Humphrey's plane, and we waked him here in, um, in uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral. And uh, I remember coming out, the, the, there was crowds that were eight, eight deep on the sidewalk as far down Fifth Avenue and Madison Avenue, as you can see. And when we came back out of the church, and I was one of the pallbearers, there was a black lady who was very, very large, and she, um, she broke down, she knelt down on the, you know, like fell down on the sidewalk, and she was holding a handkerchief and saying, uh, shouting at my father, you did your best, you did your best. It was a very moving moment for me. Then we took him to, um, to uh, Penn Station and we brought him down to Washington, D.C. On, uh, on the train. That train ride is supposed to take two and a half hours. It took seven and a half hours because there was two and a half million people on the tracks. Mm. And it was, uh, it was a whole cross section of the American experience. So I was a 14 year old boy riding on that train with all the people who would have been part of his gov government. There was poets and there was economists and writers and priests and rabbis. But the, the crowd along the track was a cross section of the entire American experience. And all the major cities um, in Trenton, Newark, Baltimore, Wilmington, um, we, we crawled through the train stations at maybe one mile an hour because there were so many people in the station, all black faces. They were singing the battle hymn of the Republic, Glory, Glory, Hallelujah, which was the same hymn that they had sung when, when Lincoln had died and they brought him back to Illinois on the train. And um, in the countryside, there were whites and they were you know people in military uniform there were Boy Scout troops standing at attention. I remember passing a little league field 
where all of the people, the players on both sides, were standing at attention, holding their gloves at their chest, the coaches, all the people in the stands. Uh, there were, uh, I remember, outside of Wilmington, looking down on a field, and there were six nuns standing in the back of a yellow pickup truck, and they were all waving their rosaries and handkerchiefs at us as we passed. People were holding signs that said, goodbye, Bobby, um, pray for us, Bobby. Um, and they were holding uh, American flags, and there were hippies, there were people in military uniform. It was, uh, uh, you know, and then when we got to Washington, President Johnson met us there and, you know, and, and then drove us in a convoy up past the mall. And at that time on the Washington Mall, there was probably six or seven, maybe 8,000 men encamped. My father had been communicating with Dr. King. And at that time, the Vietnam War was robbing the, the poverty program. Mm. And Dr. King broke with the rest of the civil rights movement. Because he said, we need to be opposing the war. That has to be because, and, and the rest of the, you know, the, uh, even Walter Fondleroy and Ralph Abernathy and many of the other leaders of the civil rights movement were telling him that stay in our lane. We need to focus on civil rights. Don't get involved with the war. And he said, if you can't separate them because that war is robbing the, pro pro the poverty programs at home, but also it's black people are fighting that war. And they are going to, and the, and the violence is going to come home. You cannot be an imperial country abroad and still be a democracy at home. It's going to turn us into a surveillance state, a security state, and the violence is going to come back. And, you, and all of the issues, the oppression, uh, the hunger, the violence, the deprivation, um, is, you can't, it is going to come home. Yeah. So my father and he got together, and they, um, they had both worried at that time about, uh, about how do you get legislation for the poor. And my father had said to Dr. King, the only way to do it is do it the same way we did with the Civil Rights March. Have poor people come to Washington, camp on the mall, and don't leave until there's legislation, you know, taking care of homelessness, et cetera. So they had both put together this woman called um, Marion Wright Edelman, who was friends with both of them, and to organize the Poor People's Campaign. Dr. King had been killed two months earlier. My father spoke, my father was in, in Indiana when Dr. King, was, when his death was announced, when my father learned, and my father was in the black sack, was going into the black neighborhood in Indianapolis, and the, the uh, chief of police said, you can't go in there, it's gonna erupt in violence when they finally find out my father went alone because the police wouldn't accompany him. And he gave a speech that's very one of his most famous speeches in which he talked about his own brother being killed by a white man. And that what our nation needs is not hatred and anger and division. What we need is love. And he, uh, and he, um, and he talked, he quoted Aeschylus to a, you know, to a group of Americans, black Americans, um, a famous poem where Eskola, where Sophocles says um, that, you know, our, our objective is to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of the world. That night, because of his speech, Indiana was the only city that didn't burn in our country. Wow. There were riots in every other city. So he then, so now two months later, my father is killed. And, um, and, the, all these poor men are encamped on the mall, and as we drove by them, they all came to the sidewalk, and they stood with their heads bowed and their hats against their chest. And we drove my father up the hill and buried him next to his brother on, under a small stone at Arlington. And I remember four years after that, looking at, um, as I was at college then in Boston, mm. I looked at this demographic data of studying politics in American history, and that showed that in 1972, four years later, the, the white people who had lined that track and who had, who had supported my father strongly during the 1968 election, four years later, they didn't vote for George McGovern, who was aligned with my father and very close, good friends with him. But instead, they voted for George Wallace, who was running that year too, who was antithetical to everything my father believed in. So how do these whites 
who were aligned with blacks and this idealistic vision that my father had of this country, suddenly, four years later, they were angry, bitter, racist, segregationists. And, um, you know, it occurred to me then, and it struck me many, many times since, that every nation, like every individual, has a darker side and a lighter side. The easiest thing for a politician to do is to appeal to our fear, our greed, our hatred, yeah. our anger, our xenophobia, and that, you know, what my father did was to try to do something different, which is to get us all seats to each other as part of a community, and to take risks for people who don't look like you, and to f feel like we're all part of a noble adventure, you know, to make this... Um, this experiment in democracy uh, worked for our country and for the rest of the world. And he was able to do that to get people to find a hero inside of them themselves and put aside a lot of their fears about their neighbors and avoid the seduction of the notion that we can advance ourselves as a people by leaving our poor brothers and sisters behind or people don't look like us. I, I went to college and then went to law school. I worked at the DA in Manhattan for uh, a a couple of years, mm -hmm. and then I became an environmental lawyer. And I, I came, you know, I ended up starting this uh, this group called Riverkeeper. Um, I my first case was representing the NAACP up on the Hudson River in Austin, New York. The uh, the uh, the city of Austin wanted to build a um, a waste transfer transfer station in the the, the, the oldest black neighborhood in New York State, which is in Austin, the neighborhood that's been there since before the Civil War. And it wasn't, they, they weren't poor, they just didn't have the political clout to keep that waste transfer station moving. And they asked me to represent them, and I did, and we killed that proposal. Then I went to work for fishermen on the Hudson River. And we started a group called Riverkeeper. We have on the Hudson, we have the oldest commercial fishery in North America. It's 350 years old. Many of the people I represented for the past 35 years come from families that have been fishing the river continuously since Dutch colonial times. You guys see the Hudson and you see this sort of dirty water, but yeah. there's so many fish. It is, it's the richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces mm -hmm. more pounds of fish per acre, Yikes. more biomass per gallon. Right. Yeah, that scares me. <laughs> that scares me. Yeah, there, are the river. <laughs> there are there's sturgeon in that river that are eleven feet long. And and how many heads do they have? <laughs> <laughs> they have two hundred yeah. pounds of caviar in them. Wow. Mm. wow. And there used to be a huge caviar fishery on the Hudson, but you know, there's striped bass and sturgeon and herring and alewives and blue crab and, and bluefish and all the saltwater fish. Because the Hudson is tidal all the way up to Albany. Right. And it rises, and so the salt line goes up the river, and we've had sharks and even whales go all the way up, 30 or 40 miles up the river. But we have this commercial fishery that I represented, and it's uh, most of the people in that fishery are in up in Grotenville, New York, a little village um, that, uh, you know, and the people there are, are, are not your prototypical environmentalists, they're factory workers, carpenters, lathers, electricians, half the people in Grote Mill made their living or at least some part of it fishing or grabbing the Hudson. And in 1966, Penn Central Railroad began vomiting oil from a four and a half foot pipe into the Croton Harmon rail yard, from the rail yard into the river. And the, the oil went up on the river on the tides and made it black in the beaches and made the shad taste of diesel. So they couldn't sell them down here at the Fulton Fish Market in New York City. And all the people in Crotonville came together in the only public building in the town, which was the American Legion Hall. This was a, this was a very patriotic village. And Crotonville had one of the highest mortality rates in World War II of any community in our country. Almost all of the original founders and board members of, of Riverkeeper, my group, were former Marines. They were combat veterans from World War II and Korea. They weren't radicals, they weren't militants, they were people whose patriotism was rooted in the bedrock of our country. Mm. But that night they started talking about violence. And they, uh, somebody said, <laughs> they had been to the government agencies that are supposed to protect Americans from pollution. 
Um, but they were given the bums rush. They were told, these are important people, Penn Central Railroad, the, the richest people in the state, we can't force them to comply with the law. Right. And all of these men and women, 300 people, came together in this American Legion Hall in March of 1966, and they started talking about violence. And they, somebody said that they should put a match to the oils like coming out of the Penn Central pipe and burn up the pipe. Somebody else said they should roll a wrap mattress up the pipe and jam it up there and, and flood the rail yard with its own waves. Somebody else said they should float a raft of dynamite into the intake of the Indian Point power plant, which at that time was killing a million fish a day. Wow. on its intake screens and taking food off their family tables. And then this guy stood up who was a former Marine uh, and he was the outdoor writer for Sports Illustrated. His name was Bob Boyle. And he said, um, he, he had researched, he'd been, he had done an article about angling in the Hudson, about people, there was these fishing clubs, sewer fishing clubs in New York City that were fascinating and people who were fished up and down the river, 200 pieces of, pieces of fish. It, in this article two years before, and in researching it, he found this ancient navigational statute called the 1888 Rivers and Harbors Act and said it was illegal to pollute any waterway in the United States. You had to pay a big penalty if you got caught, but also there was a bounty provision that said that anybody who turned in the polluter got to keep half the fine. And nobody had ever enforced this law before. And on that night, he stood up in front of him with a copy of that law, and he said, we shouldn't be talking about breaking the law. We should be talking about enforcing it. And they started a group that night called the Hudson River Fishermen. It later became Riverkeeper, and they started suing polluters. Wow. And 18 months later, they collected the first bounty in United States history under this 19th century statute. They got to keep $2,000. They shut down the Penn Central Pipe. They used that money to go after Sibagagi, Tuck Tape, Standard Brand, American Cyanamid, the biggest corporations in America, winning tens of thousands of dollars in bounties. In, in 1973, they collected the highest penalty in the United States history against the corporate polluter. They got $200,000 from Anaconda Wire and Cable for dumping toxics from Hastings, New York. They used that money to build a boat and they began patrolling the river, and they hired me as a, their full-time attorney. Mm. And we sued over 500 polluters on the river. We forced them to spend $5 billion. Um, wow. And, uh, and they, uh, today, the Hudson's the richest waterway in the North Atlantic, and the miraculous resurrection of the Hudson inspired the creation of river keepers, water keepers all over the, the world. So we now have 350 of them, each with a patrol boat. And it's the biggest water protection uh, uh, group on earth. Wow. You know, one of the things I mentioned is that, you know, one of the things I learned very early on, I did a lot of work um, here, you know, in Harlem and, and uh, you know, elsewhere, um, is that uh, pollution disproportionately harms the poor. Four out of every five toxic waste dumps in America is in a black neighborhood. The largest toxic waste dump in America is Emile, Alabama, which is 85% black. The highest concentration of toxic waste dump in America is the south side of Chicago. Wow. The most contaminated zip code is East LA. And, you know, probably, you know, you can name a lot of problems that the black community has, but, you know, one of the worst is toxicity is, you know, the, that comes from lead, that comes from these. That comes from whitening. Toxic exposures, yeah. yeah. And, bad, and bad food, by the way. I mean, 75% of, of food stamps are spent on processed food, which is just poison. It's just poison. 10% goes to uh, soda. But, uh, yeah. you know, black kids in Harlem are more, have a 44% uh, of them have toxic levels of lead in their blood. Um, they are more likely to die of a brain tumor than a bullet. And, wow. uh, and they're most likely to die of suicide than anything else now, today, since the pandemic. Wow. And these are environmental exposures and, um, you know, they're, uh, and, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge issue that I've been litigating on for many years. I sued, at one point, I sued the New York City water supply. New York has the best drinking water in the world of any city. It, 
it's, it has this incomparable taste that accounts for the, the amazing taste and unique taste of New York City pizza and New York City bagels. <laughs> yeah, know, I do I, taste tap water in the pizza <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. I, well, yeah, it's, it's there. I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> and it comes from two water supplies. One of them in the Catskills that's very, very pure. Mm. Two, actually, two, the Delaware and Catskill system, very, very good water. On the east side of the Hudson is um, the uh, Croton system. And it's very small, it's only 10% of the water. But it has 102 sewage treatment plants discharging into it, and there's no filtration. So that, the water from those wastewater treatment plants is going right to people's taps. Wow. And during the you know, dry summer months, if you drink a cup of coffee, if you're in the distribution district for that Croton water, your cup of coffee is going to be about 3% uh, sewage from you know, a plant that's been through a plant. Wow. Well, I asked New York City to give me the distribution because I want to see the neighborhoods that were getting this. And they, they wouldn't, they said it was national security. This was long before 9-11. This is like in the 90s, right? And so I sued them and they, for a year they stonewalled me and then they gave me the distribution maps on the, on the courthouse steps. And the maps had, the, the neighborhoods that were getting the Croton water were colored dark on those maps and it was Harlem, South Bronx, Lower East Side, Hell's Kitchen. Wow. Mm. And, um, and it was, when he went down the Upper East Side, there was one little tiny dot of white where it was getting the good water in this kind of sea of blackness. And I had to get the magnifying glass out to look at it. It was Gracie Mansion. So the mayor's house was getting the good water, but all the mm. surrounding neighborhoods were you know, getting the, wow. the poor water. And whose fault is that? Who's directly to blame for that happening? Who made the decision that this water goes to these? You know what? It, it, it's it's a it's a quite it's not so much. I, I don't believe it's from direct racism. I think it's from the powerlessness of the black community. They know people can't complain. You know this sewage treatment plant that's over on the on, in North Harlem on the west side. Mm -hmm. It's called the North River plant. That plant was supposed to be put at the 79th Street boat base which is the logical place for that plant because that boat basin was the outlet of a river. Right. And that's where you want the sewage because it means there's a, it, you're, you're going down grade that all, you know, it's the bottom of a, of a gradient of a watershed so you don't have to put in pumps and it's very cheap because the water side. flows directly into that plant, mm -hmm. right? The same that all the water in that area. Well, they try <laughs> to put it on the 79th Street uh, but the people who were at the 79th Street said, we don't want it here. And they were wealthy people. Mm -hmm. So they could call the mayor, they had given him contributions, et cetera, and said, you got to move this. We don't want this here. We, we paid a lot for these properties. The smell of that plant is going to degrade our property values. Do not put it here. So they kicked it uptown again and again and again, and it finally landed. You guys know where it is, right? Right under, almost, you know, almost to the George Washington Bridge. Oh, but that's yeah, not, yeah. you know, that big plant. It's out yeah. in the river, yep. right? Yeah. And um, but and that neighborhood is not a poor neighborhood. It's black, but it's not poor. Mm. It's professionals who live there. It's like doctors, lawyers, you know, people of means, people who own their own apartments, etc. But they just weren't connected, and so uh, they did not have the political clout to, you know, to kick it somewhere else. Yeah. And that's how, to me, that's how, you know, I see this environmental racism all the time. Yeah. But I never, you know, I've never found papers where people said, "Let's put this in a black neighborhood." It's just that's where the the place of least resistance when mm -hmm. it comes to, you know. It doesn't have to say black neighborhood on right. it for it to be racist or for, for, for that to even if it's passive racism. We know who doesn't have the power. We know yeah. who's not going to fight back. A bunch of people who have means and who are doing well still, still end up with a sewage treatment plant because these guys didn't want it. it, it yeah. Are you seeing what you're saying? Oh, yeah, I same, know. For the same reason that there's more police presence in impoverished neighborhoods because they don't have the money to fight the cases. So well, they Exactly. Well, you know, I had a case in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. um, where the, the Navy was bombing the island of Vieques. 
and it was it was there were people who live there, the, the poorest people in the Caribbean in uh, in Puerto Rico. The, the highest cancer rate because the detonation of naval ordnance had released all these chemicals like antimony, arsenic, lead, benzene, toluene, xylene, really bad stuff, and they were all poisoned. And they had no economy because they were bombing it all the time. There were much better places for them to do that bombing up on the North Carolina coast. But Puerto Rico doesn't have a congressperson. And they didn't have, and this was the poorest part of Puerto Rico, and so it's the same thing. And I, I ended, they ended up putting me in prison down there for in maximum security prison for the whole summer of 2001. I, I ended up down there because I was, you know, from hmm. from litigating this case. <clears throat> wow, wow, well, so I gotta nice. ask. Go for it. I want to rewind back. Uh, you said there are light and dark sides to everyone. Seeing what, what your uncle and your father went through in politics, what's the driving force for you to also take that path? Well, I never intended to go into politics. I never, you know, I toyed with it a couple of times. What did you but, want to do? Well, I liked what I was doing. I'm like what? <laughs> yeah, I like you know I, I like doing work on the environment. Right. I'm outdoors all the time, and I'm uh, you know I have a very happy life. I I um you know and I have a I have a very happy marriage, and you know my wife is amazing. My wife is an actress, Cheryl Hines, who's mm -hmm. on uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yes. Huh. Sure. And, and, yeah. Way to go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's how I feel. And um, and then I have so we have seven kids, and I have a you know really good life, and I do litigation. I'm suing big polluters, so I feel good about you know what I do. Like I have a mission. So why take this path? But I because you know I, I've been censored now by uh, by first the Trump administration and the Biden administration, um, and. Uh, and then um, I saw what was happening with the war. I saw, see what's happening with the Democratic Party, that it's abandoned you know, the, the ideals that my father had, that my uncle had. And I, um, I felt like I was in a unique place to be able to challenge that. So, um, and that I, whatever happened, I needed to talk about it. I needed to tell people, you know, this is not right, what's happening. You know, Democrats don't censor people. And the Democratic Party is not the party of war. Mm. Oh, and, and, you know, we're, listen, we give $113 billion to Ukraine. We topped it off in March. Yeah. So that same month in March, um, I have a buddy who's a commercial fisherman who's worked his whole life as hard as he could. He's got a lot of injuries. And the kind of business that he had, he doesn't have a pension. You know, he had his own business. Oh. He's was on. He's been on um, on food stamps. He's getting two hundred eighty-three dollars a month from SNAP, and he was got a phone call, an automated phone call. And by the way, two hundred eighty-three dollars doesn't go so far no, you know, yeah. for a month. Okay, know. it's like nine dollars a day, yeah. and the price of food because of paying for all the wars, the price of food, you know, is, is going up seventy-six percent in two years of. of they tell you the government says the price of food's gone up 20% in two years, but for, for good, decent, uh, basic foods, chicken, dairy, milk, di uh, dairy, eggs, 76%. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> my friend getting $283 a month and trying to live, he got a phone call, automated phone call the first day of March saying his food stamps have been cut by 90% to $23 a month. 30 million Americans got that call. 15 million Americans got their Medicaid cut that month. The same month, we send top off our aid to Ukraine, 113 billion. If we weren't sending that to Ukraine, we could feed these Americans. And, um, and that same month, we print 300 billion dollars to pay off the Silicon Valley Bank because it failed. Mm -hmm. 
So we have a lot of money for the people who are rich and for the military industrial complex, uh, but for, you know, 57% of Americans could not put their hands on $1,000 if they have an emergency. And 25% of Americans are now hungry. Uh, and, you know, we, we, uh, we need to get our priorities straight. Right. And we didn't need to have that war. The Ukrainians, we, we forced Ukraine into that war. We should have just minded our business. They not only, said, yeah, if we had minded our business, they had already signed a peace treaty. They had a peace treaty called the Minsk Accords that everybody had agreed to. Zelensky ran, got 70% of the votes saying that he was going to sign it. It left all of Ukraine intact. It just protected the Russian, ethnic Russians and Donbass. Uh, protect them so they could speak their own language and they wouldn't be killed by the government, which we installed. We, you know, we paid for that coup in 2014, put our own government in, and they started killing Russians. So they had settled it. And we went in and told him he couldn't settle it. And then in April of 2022, just after the Russians invaded, the Russians wanted to settle it. And they only sent 40,000 troops in. They wanted us to come to the table. Zelensky signs and Putin sign a, a peace agreement. And Putin starts withdrawing all of his troops. We send uh, Boris uh, Johnson over there, the, 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 the uh, former prime minister of England, mm -hmm. to kill the agreement and say, we don't want to settle. We want a war with Russia. When, when Biden was asked, why are we, we doing this war? He said, regime change in Russia. That's our objective. That's not good for the Ukraine. We, my son went over there and fought because he was, he's idealistic. He didn't tell me where he was going. He went over there, he joined a special forces unit. He was a machine gunner, um, was in the Kharkiv offensive and, you know, um, and, you know, risked his life. And now 350,000 kids have been killed from the Ukrainian side alone. And it's a war that should never have happened that we, you know, we, uh, the, the story that we're told that, you know, um, that was an unprovoked invasion by um, by Putin is not the accurate story. There's a, another story, and that is that the U.S. wanted this war. Lloyd Austin, in the same month in April, when we sabotaged it, Lloyd Austin, who's the Secretary of Defense, was asked by um, uh, by the press, "Why are we in this war?" And he said, "Because we're going to. We want to exhaust the Russian army and degrade its capacity to fight anywhere else in the world. And we don't have to kill American. You know, he didn't say this, but but earlier position papers had said we should draw Russia into war with a country like Afghanistan or the Ukraine, where you know their soldiers are going to be dying. We'll provide them the equipment and." Uh, um, and we'll exhaust them, you know, they, and that's not it. Is not a good outcome for uh, for uh, you, for Ukraine. Right. By the way, the, the same people who are engineering the Ukraine war are the same ones who engineered the Iraq war. The neocons, Victoria Newland, the same. Uh, the Iraq war. I don't know how old you guys are. You're 47, so you remember the original. <laughs> <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot listen to him. You cannot listen to him. He barely remembers his battle raps. Don't, 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 don't listen to him. But, you know, we were tricked into the war of Iraq. We were told there were weapons of mass destruction. We were led to believe that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11, which he didn't. Um, that he was harboring terrorists, which he wasn't, that he had weapons of mass destruction, which he didn't. We had to go in there and do a preemptive war, which America has never done before. We go in there and we get rid of Saddam Hussein. It caused us, in the end, that war led us into Syria, Yemen, Libya. Mm -hmm. The whole thing cost $8 trillion. Oh, what do we get for $8 trillion? And that's bankrupt of the middle class in this country. The way they pay for that is through inflation, which is a tax on the middle class and the poor. And what do we get for that war? Well, here's what we got. Iraq is worse off than we found, than, what it, than it was under Saddam. We killed more Iraqis than he ever did. We killed between 600,000 and a million. 
Iraq today is just a, is an incoherent nation. It's a battle between Shia and Sunni death squads. It's not a safe place to do business or to live. We've pushed Iraq into a proxy posture with Iran. So Iran is now controlling Iraq, which is exactly the outcome we were trying to avoid. Right. We created ISIS. We drove two million refugees to Europe. And you know the riots that are happening in France now are those refugees. Yeah. And and Bre uh, Brexit, you know, is from that that uh, mm -hmm. that immigration is what drove you know the, the Brexit and broke up Europe. Oh, these are the outcomes. It's the same same way with Bin Laden. Exactly. Yeah. These are the, you know the outcomes that we got for eight trillion dollars, and now we don't have a middle class left in America, and that's really our strength comes from. Our strength Ooh. comes from the middle class. Two questions: Who benefits? And what can we as a people, and I know, you know, people ask this question all the time, but what specifically can raise the awareness where the people in these neighborhoods, the people who, who are not uh, in, in, in connection with the, the politicians, what can we do? What on the ground level, I'm talking about from step one, whether it's pick up a phone or, or go to this website or, or stop supporting this, what exactly can we do to change uh, I mean, uh, uh, people need to be educated. And Martin Luther King's time, he was educating people and saying, you know, 45% of every paratrooper movement um, uh, unit in Vietnam is black. And, you know, today, for, you know, if you're not a sports star or a rap star like yourselves or hip hop stars, <laughs> but you live in the easy life like yourselves, if you're, <laughs> is that what this is? <laughs> I missed it completely. <laughs> you know, what, what is your choice if you're in this neighborhood? And, you know, I, I admire you so much because you told me that you never took a drug. You know, and, I, and that, you know, coming from, from where you came from, from a, you know, a, a, with all the challenges, that takes incredible character. You know, that is, that you are a man of immense character. So, uh, thank you. you know, it's true. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is, and, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but what, what is available to a kid who wants to escape, you know, the, the, this life? Right. Well, if you're not a you know an NBA athlete and if you're not a hip hop star, your your main choice is the military. If you don't want to go into a gang, well, you go into the military because they're going to pay for your education, they're going to pay for your housing, they're going to give you a health care program. But the, the 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 fix is that you've got to go kill people, and yeah. that is going to that is going to cripple you. Yeah, I have family members who 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 kind of struggle with that. They, they've been in the military for years. You know, they had to work these operations where when they come home, all they do is drink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they've got, you know, yeah. PTSD. Yeah. yeah. And the same kind of drugs that these kids are looking to escape. These vets are coming home looking to escape. They don't want to think about what they just yeah. happened. Who's to blame? I think so many more presidential and, and candidates period across the across the map would get so much further if you would tell us this is the guy who made the decision to do xyz a b and c one two and three yeah or these three guys like when you tell us about somebody putting a plant where it shouldn't be right or you tell us about Somebody saying, hey, we're going to go do this war regardless it, of what you think, or, or we're going to spend this money. falls under the category of they. they. Right. Who's they? Who made the decision to say, hey, we're going to spend this much money on the Ukraine instead of feeding people yeah. who actually or, need it? Or, Who's or that guy or that girl or that group? Who, it, who are it, they? It's called the military-industrial complex. And, and uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower who was the general in world, you know, the commanding general of the Allied forces in World War II, then ran for president. And the day that he left office, January 17th, 1961, my birthday, my, I, and I was in Washington. Three days later, I'd watch my uncle take the oath of office. Um, but Eisenhower made the most important speech probably now in American history, where he warned America that if you, um, that if we were not careful, um, that the military industrial, this permanent warfare economy and machine that we created would destroy our democracy. 
would subvert all of the institutions that we've created, would impoverish our country and turn us into a surveillance and security state. And um, my uncle, he actually tried to make peace with the Soviet Union, but the CIA thwarted him. Alan Dulles thwarted him. And my uncle comes in. What was the guy's name? Who Alan him? Dulles. He's the guy who, he was the big villain in American history. He's Alan the guy Dulles. Okay. Who, who turned the CIA into this, you know, machine for overthrowing democracies and, um, and you know, turned it against the American people. And he was, you know, he then lied to my uncle about the Bay of Pigs. My uncle said, why are we going down? Because they're, they're, my uncle comes into office and they said, they said, first thing you need to know is we're about to invade Cuba. It's a secret. We've trained 2,000 Cuban troops. They're, you know, they're, uh, they're armed, they're dangerous, and we're going to send them down and we're going to overthrow Castro. And we're going to need U.S. military support. And, uh, and my uncle said, I'm not doing that. Why? He said, I don't like that Castro has a communist government, but that's Cuba's business. It's not American business. People can choose their own governments and experiment with them. And we don't have to like them, um, but we don't have a right to change them. And America's not going to you know, invade a little tiny country that's a bad look and be a bully. And he said, Dulles and his joint chief said, well, don't worry. Uh, the troops are going to go over there, and you just we need to carry them the Navy, and then they'll do all the fighting. And my uncle said, well, Castro's got 200,000, an army of 200,000 men. How are these 2,000 men going to defeat that army? And he said, that, see, the CIA lied to him, and they said, we've infiltrated the army. We know that they're going to rise up and turn on Castro as soon as our men land. Mm. Mm. And my uncle said, well, you're not using the U.S. military. My uncle didn't want to send them, but the CIA said, if you keep these guys here, they're going to cause terrible trouble because they're armed and dangerous. And they're going to, they're going to consider you a traitor, and they're going to cause a lot of trouble. So my uncle said, you're not going to use the U.S. military. So they got United Fruit, which owned all the sugar cane before cash would throw them out to give them boats to bring those men over. And the men died on the beach or were captured by Castro. And that's what my uncle said, I want to shatter the CIA in a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. And my uncle then, you know, the CIA wanted him to go into Laos, he refused. They wanted him to go to Vietnam, he refused. They wanted him to go to war in 62 with Russia. Instead, he made friends secretly with Khrushchev. Mm -hmm. They started corresponding with each other and they both realized that they were surrounded by people who wanted them to go to war. And, uh, and my uncle kept kept him out, uh, but the military, but then my uncle's killed, almost certainly by the CIA and the military industrial complex. My father then runs against them. He also gets killed, um, again, almost certainly by the CIA. The man who actually fired the shots that killed him was a CIA asset, a guy called Eugene St. Cesar. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, we now know, was a CIA asset. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and they, you know, the military industrial, and we went through all of these traumas. My father's death, Dr. King's death, Malcolm X's death, the Vietnam War, the 9-11, um, and COVID. Each one pushed us further down the road into a security state, into becoming more a possession of the military. When Mitch McConnell was asked about, well, you know, why are we spending 113 billion in in uh, Ukraine? He said, uh, "Well, the uh, he said, don't worry about it because that money is not actually staying in Ukraine. It is going to military contractors. It's it's just going over, you know, technically going to Ukraine, but we're actually just buying, you know, yeah. going to General Dynamics and." Yeah, other right. soldiers. And he said, so it's all American companies, and that's good for our country. Yeah. And that's and that is their right. rationale. And, that, and they're, they're, over there, they're killing Ukrainian kids, so nobody here is going to complain because nobody here is, you know, we're watching the coffins come home. Right. And so it's the perfect war for the military. They get to, you know, get re up their contracts, and, you know, and those are the people who drive policy in Washington, D.C. So, so is Mitch McConnell they? 
He's part of them. Okay. I mean, Joe Biden is they. Because when, you know, when you Joe say Biden is Joe there. Biden, is when you say the, the military it? industrial complex, I'm still looking for names. Like where the my Victoria people. Newland, Joe Biden, Anthony Blinken. Those are the people who are dri- who are driving it. Those three, the, those 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 three names. Yeah, those three names. Okay, so when you get in, Joe Biden will go and you'll yeah. fire the other guys. Is that, is no, that the no, the, yeah, all of those. You know, I I will reorganize the CIA, and I'm gonna. We have 800 bases abroad. You know how many the Chinese have? One and a half. I don't, I, the Russians may have one. I don't know, but we have 800. And each one is just a platform for a new war. And the function of the CIA is to provide the military industrial complex. This, my, uh, my uncle discovered this with this a pipeline of continual new wars, you know, to, uh, to fuel that. And, and <coughs> That money is being paid by the American middle class. That's why we don't have a middle class left in this country. Oh, wow. Okay. okay, so now we know who they is. <laughs> and you, I mean, with, with the resistance that, the, that your father and your uncle face, you don't have a fear of this? Hey, you want to pick a fight with these people? You know what? I am I'm much more scared of than of dying. I am much more frightened that my kids are going to grow up in an America where they don't have rights. And that, you know, we're, we're now just addicted to permanent war. And there was a whole generation of Americans in 1776 that gave us this constitution that and many of them died. Between 25,000 and 70,000 Americans died in, in the Revolutionary War to give us the, the Bill of Rights. Right. Now, and then we created this incredible middle class, and that's all being stripped from us now. And so, you know, I think all of us have to be willing to make, you know, take risks and make sacrifices so that our kids can have those same rights. When we speak about the day, because we often in this room speak about the day, um, Biden and the other names that you named, those are the people that, you know, they're going to deteriorate. They're not going to last. So who comes after them? Or would you say that it is a force that's maybe even beyond human being? Yeah, I, well, it's a self-perpetuating system where, you know, the, the, uh, both, now both the, we used to at least have one party that was anti-war. You know, the Democratic Party was always anti-war and the Republican Party was pro-war, but now they're both pro-war. And, you know, so it's self-propagating. The people who rise to the top of those parties and get the contributions so that they can run for office and get the promotions are the people who support the war machine. And, you know, I'm running against the war machine. Oh, and I, you know, I'm a threat to those, to all of those interests. Is there any say any satanic thing behind what? like that? Any satanic thing behind uh, any of that? That is beyond my range of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds. It seems, I'm sure you've you know, heard things though. Yeah, I. Because uh, yeah. we hear things, you know, we hear things out here, and we hear that the powers that be are really a a satanic group that is being disguised. So you know, I'm know in your profession, you will know something like that. Yeah, I'm sure they don't see themselves that way, but maybe they do. I don't know. We Secret all have a, we all have a uh, we all have a this a capacity to judge ourselves based upon our intentions rather than our actions, you know what I mean? And people, you know, have a, a, can convince themselves that what they're doing, whatever it is, is right. I mean, people as I uh, People think, you know, people believe that we're there helping the Ukrainian people in a fight for freedom. And that is the narrative. And, you know, we're given these kind of comic book narratives. There's a good guy and a bad guy, and we're always on the good side. But we've been involved in, you know, uh, you know in hundreds of, of foreign wars. And, you know, and Russia and China haven't. Uh, we need to start looking at our own involvement. And you're not bothered by the idea that bringing this kind of stuff to the forefront puts you in danger by people who don't want it to stop. 
I I am, but I'm and I'm care. You know, I take what care that I can. Um, but uh, I think it's more important. I mean, for me, I feel like I I I don't have a choice that I need to fight this. Okay. Okay. Why should anyone believe you? Well, nobody should believe me. People should do their own investigation. And, you know, if what I turn out and say, I think if you investigate it, that you'll be convinced that it's correct. But you shouldn't believe me just because I'm sitting here talking to you. Okay. Second, why should anyone trust you? That your agenda is what you say it is, that once you get in office, these are the things that you're going to attempt to change. Yeah. Well, that's an easy one. Because the cliche is it doesn't. Yeah, that's an easy one because I have a track record. You know, I have a track record over the last 18 years of standing up against corporate power and against government corruption and uh, and being punished for it constantly, being Hmm. censored, being, um, you know, having... uh, uh, suffering a lot of, you know, loss of friendship, losses of uh, of relationships, loss, dramatic <coughs> losses of income, um, and you know, and uh, loss of status, um, mm. and the you know the power that I once had, I wielded because I'm I'm a member of this family and because I had a long credible record as an environmentalist, and I walked away from that this battle and people have watched me over years fight this battle so um you know i think i have a i i i think if you talk to me because you guys don't have not been following me but i think if you talk to people or you know read about my uh, track record i think that that would uh, convince you that i that the one thing i am is trustworthy I wasn't sure you were going to answer that question at all. The important question is, will you consider Kanye West for for the vice president? (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm thinking Killer Mike or Kendrick. (laughs) Killer Killer Mike or Kendrick. (laughs) Killer Mike. Michael and Mike. Mike. Yeah. My kids love Killer Mike. I love Killer Mike. Yeah. I, I um I, I would love to I, I you know I can't get him on the phone anymore. <laughs> uh, he no? stopped answering my calls. He stopped answering your call? Yeah. Didn't you two get it? I think he got in some now. kind of trouble what? hanging out with you. Um, yeah, I think he got in trouble for hanging out with me. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I mm. saw so, that so did Cube. Was, so the cube. Yeah, we're yeah. Like, we're we're next. Like you, you yeah. we're definitely on the list. We're, yeah. we're in trouble now. Are you on yeah. YouTube? Hmm? Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, See? <laughs> uh, no. What, what's no. your condition? Let's for not. Just don't say the V word. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If we we'll leave that jobs, alone. Just keep this yeah, in mind. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah, your yeah, fault. Yeah. <laughs> but that that was one of the things that I did identify with you on taking that stance. So, all right. Well, if you're on YouTube, we shouldn't talk about it. That yes, at all, at all. What's the position on reparations? Well, my I got you. yeah. Um, my, listen. Like, can I tell you about a little bit about my Absolutely. background? So, my father in 1966 um, walked through Bed Stuy. And he walked down Fulton Street, Atlantic Avenue. And bed at that time was, um, by most of the indicia of, of, you know, they, by which you measure poverty, it was one of the most extreme levels of poverty in yeah. America, comparable to, you know, Watts or Compton. Or, but there was something unique about bed excuse me, which was that um, there was a huge, very, very high level of home ownership that which is unlike Harlem, which was, at, there was a lot of absentee owners in Harlem. Right. bed a lot of those families had been there since right after the Civil War. And the, the houses were, were humble, but people owned their own houses. And you saw, you know, people, there were flowers on the, on the stoops. And, you know, the houses were sort of painted. And it, people cared about the community. Right. And my father fell in love with that community. And actually, Arthur Schlesinger, who wrote a book about who wrote the most famous biography of my father, 
said that in that book that when Robert Kennedy was not at home, the place that he wanted to be more than any other was Bedford Stuyvesant. Mm. And what he saw in that community is that there was this, this also this entrepreneurial spirit where people, you know, were, wanted to be in business and they were, they were innovative and energetic, but they didn't have access to capital. And they didn't, they, they, you know, they were redlined from the banks. The banks would not make loans in that area. Uh, they, they were redlined from insurance companies that, you know, car insurance and a lot of other uh, things that were disadvantages. Oh. But the big disadvantage, they didn't have access to capital and they did not have access to uh, knowledge to it. To, my father, you know, grew up among people where if he needed to call somebody from Harvard Business School to ask a business problem, he could call somebody. Mm -hmm. But there was no access in that neighborhood to that. So a businessman who, you know, who was smart and everything, but did not have, just couldn't, he didn't have that accumulated um, access to, uh, to that kind of, to business knowledge. So my father put together a group of top-level businessmen, Andre Meyer from Lazard Frères, Tom Watson from IBM, and a bunch of others, and got them to make a commitment to come to bed regularly and to mentor businesses. And then uh, when my, my father died, I went on the board of Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration. We built Restoration Plaza over there. And when I first went over there, I don't know if you are. You, are you from? I'm from, I'm yeah, from Brooklyn. From Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's from Best. Yeah. 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 Restoration is on Fulton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah right. Definitely. So my father built that, and you know, I was on the board for thir for all, thirty-five years. We bought the Pathmark store there when we when we first when I first went out there. The closest grocery store was seventy-five blocks, three bus. Right. So um, a woman who was trying to feed her kids had to get on three buses, get her loads of grocery, climb, climb back on those buses at 75 blocks. And we got Pathmark to move into Restoration Plaza, which mm -hmm. you know, it changed a lot of people. And then we built a theater there. We built, you know, sports centers and, um, and, uh, and, uh, um, and, you know, and we, we started uh, giving access to microloans, to grants, um, to uh, opportunity um, uh, districts where, you know, it would be lower taxes. And when I first started going out there, and when my father went, all the businesses on Fulton Street were boarded up. There was nothing. <laughs> and, you know, I have now, because when I married Cheryl and moved out west of California, I, I, I stepped down off the board at that point. Um, but uh, the last time I was there, Fulton Street was thriving. There were, you know, all of these storefronts were, were crowded. Yeah. And, and that is good not only for the black community, but it's good for everybody. And for, so when you ask me about reparations, I, I'm going to tell you one other thing. I spent 20% of my time um, representing Indians during my career in the United States, in Latin America, and uh, in Canada. And a lot of the Indian tribes at that point were getting gambling. And there would be arguments, fights within the tribe about how do you distribute the, the gambling money? Do you, and the traditional chiefs would say, do not give it in cash payments because it, it is not, it, the, this, this money belongs to the entire community over the generations. <laughs> and um, and it should be uh, distributed that way. And what we saw is the tribes that that put it into institutions like clinics, scholarships, business loans, microloans, um, factory building factories, those things. Those tribes really flourished. The communities flourished, right. and that sense of community was great. And the, all the tribes that did cash payments was a catastrophe. I would be against cash just if there was no other if there was no other issue. I would be against cash payment reparations. But the word reparation means repair, and you know I grew up in a Jim Crow, and I saw 
This was not just the, the injury did not end with slavery. The injury and the deliberate suppression, the institutionalization of poverty in black neighborhoods is uh, systematic, it's systemic, and it, it, uh, and it continues today in a million different ways. Mm. And we need to rebuild the, the uh, black communities. And, and so that, you know, but my approach to doing that would be to do it in a way that I think is going to be most effective, which is what we did at bed -Stuy. We created what we call the Community Development Corporation there, and it is now the model for hundreds of community development corporations around the country because it works. And that it, it's, it's less likely to contribute to the polarization between blacks and whites because it benefits everybody. Everybody, even uh, people who are Trumpers, who I see all the time because I represent them in lawsuits against big polluters, they, if you talk about business loans to black communities, everybody's for it. You know, everybody wants business to work and to flourish. And so for me, that would be my approach, to, to do everything I can uh, to make, and you know, I was in Cleveland a couple of weeks ago. COVID wiped out the black. The, 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 That's what I mean by systemic racism. In 2008, America got wiped out by the, say, by the loan, you know, by these exotic in, uh, loan instruments, um, mm -hmm. they, you know, the, like mushroom mortgages and balloon mortgages and all that. Yeah. For 10 years before, those same banks have been trying that out, experimenting in the black community with us. And it stripped the equity out because a lot of those, those homes like in Bed-Stuy, they were in those families for generation and you could go get a mortgage, increase your mortgage and you can start a small business, buy a sewing machine, do whatever, you know. And, but then these, you know, the, the, the banks were going to these families and saying, you've got a great home, you know, we'll give you this new kind of mortgage, you don't have to pay anything for the first five years, and it's all gonna be great. And they signed on to them, they got sucked into it, and then they lost the home. And that stripped equity out of the community. And then they, and then the hospital consolidation happened. The same thing, they tried it at first out in the black communities, and they closed all the community hospitals. Wow. And then COVID happened. COVID, they closed 3.3 million businesses without due process, without just compensation. 41% of black owned business will never reopen. Many of those businesses had three generations of equity in them. You had three generations, like a barber shop like this, and they have three generations putting, you know, caring for this business, nurturing it, growing it, and making it a growing concern. And they got wiped out. And I was in Cleveland uh, three weeks ago in one of the poorest districts in Cleveland. It's called Lee Harbor. Mm. And the whole place boarded up. It is, it's like a dystopian nightmare. There's a couple of businesses left that I met with the owners of those businesses. I'm very, very interested in black owned businesses. Mm. And, um, and they said, we are going under right now because we cannot get loans because inflation hurts the poor, but interest rates hurt the poor worse. Right. Because the local banks um, will not loan because their, their, the value of their treasury bills has gone underwater and they have to retain their, they have to hoard their liquidity and so it, because to avoid being taken over by one of the big banks. None of them making, I sat in the room across from a woman who is an, an elderly uh, African American woman who's had a sausage company that has been in her family for five generations. And it is a, it's a local institution, 80 years, mm. they've been operating this country and she's shutting it down, not because there's a problem with the business. She needs a loan to upgrade some of the machinery and she cannot get a loan anywhere. And uh, you know, this, uh, and that the, the, the community is being systematically stripped. Mm. I, I, I'd say 20, I think I saw a statistic recently, by 2040, um, the, the value of equity, equity in black communities is gonna be zero. Because there's a systematic stripping of equity out of black, of ownership, right. of wealth. 
and and that is that is the same thing as slavery ultimately. Yeah. If you got no equity in your community, there's nobody even going to go to this barber shop because there's no cash. People get their hair cut at home. It destroys the community. So it, to me, um, the way you know the reparations is about figuring out every way that we can to build black-owned businesses back up. And that, and if you talk about it in that way, it doesn't inspire the polarization and the racism that if you talk about cash re uh, reparations, that, you know, that I, reaction. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you and I, I, I hear exactly where you're coming from. But I got to say, with all due respect, we in the black community, I, I'll speak for myself, but I, I think there's other people I speak for too. We in the black community are not really overly concerned about the feelings of other people who are polarized by the idea of us getting cash reparations back. If yeah. that hurts your feelings, that's kind of on you. And right. I'm not really, I'm, and I'm also, just to continue to circle the wagons, I'm also not really overly interested in what's good for everybody when I start talking about reparations. When we start having that conversation, concerned about what's good what what's good for the black people who have always been systemically behind the eight ball right due to people who will deny that that system even exists they'll tell you there is no systemic racism they'll tell you, you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps which don't exist that's after they've stolen your boots right but you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even wearing boots, so, you know. Please, I, I don't, I, and I, I completely, I completely get what you're saying, and that is one way to do it. But I don't want our financial future, or, or, or not even, maybe not even financial future, but I don't want reparations contingent on how another group feels about it, or how another group is going to look at it, or get upset about it. Like I think maybe if we start, maybe if we admit to the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Mm and what that represents and what it's done and what it's continuing to do. Maybe now that it's out on the table, we can deal with it. And maybe reparations won't hurt so bad if we're not trying to rewrite the history. If we're not trying to pretend that these things don't exist, there is no systemic racism, you just need to work harder. You had a black president, so it's not that bad. Like if maybe if we knock that stuff off, Reparations won't feel so bad if, if you get that we're really just paying back I ca I what we already it. said we were doing. I kind of see it from both sides, but I do agree with Mech because it's not like sl slavery benefited us. It didn't. So I feel like in the repair or the, the reparations of that, it shouldn't. there shouldn't be a thought of anyone else and how they feel about it. However, I get what he's saying as far as what works over time. What, what is going to actually fix the community and not just seem like Christmas for two weeks and then it's back to regularly scheduled programming. I'm, I'm, and I'm, that's why I said I, and I, that's why I said I get it. I right. completely get. <coughs> and I get it too. And I, you know, I hear what you're saying too. And I, you know, my approach is a practical approach because you just had a Supreme Court that threw out affirmative action, which right. I, you know, spoken out against that decision. Right. Uh, but um, I think reparations even a heavier lift constitutionally for this court. So I, I you know, I'm. When is that? Right. Yeah. So, uh, but, but, let me ask you something, just to, because we're talking kind of theoretically here. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, where, because I spent a lot of time working with American Indians who had the whole place taken away from them. Mm -hmm. well, the only place that was paid for was Manhattan Island for 24 bucks. Um, yeah. But the rest of it was take, taken illegally by force. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so where would they stand on the reparation scale? Mm. Oh God, this is gonna sound terrible. Let me, <laughs> let me, let me, let me, let me get a, let me get a good way to say He's it. trying to figure out I would say he doesn't care about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of where he's at. Because as much, yeah. as much love as I have for Native Americans, as much love as I have for Asian Americans, as much love as I have for white Americans, as much as I can sit here and tell you I have all of the above in my family, and I hug them, love them, fist fight for them, and the whole nine yards. When it's time to circle the wagons, no one else ever asked this question of other people. Mm -hmm. No one else is asked to think about how are these guys going to feel if we do this? No one asked the black community how we would feel 
when the money went to the Ukraine. No one cared. Well, what are the black people going to say? Nobody asked that question. Nobody cared what we thought. Right. Like, no, when, when, when Asians got the Stop Asian Hate Bill, which I was, you know, hey, stop beating up people just because they're Asian. Like, what are you doing? That's fucking ridiculous. That's retarded. Nobody asked us how we felt about that. So I'm not of the mind to consider other people when I'm looking out for what's good for my brothers and sisters in this struggle with me. Because when the cops show up, it's just us. When when you know when we're being over policed, it's just us. When we're when we're receiving higher sentences, it's just us. Nobody else is jumping in. When we get a treatment plant near our communities, it's just us. When we get pollution, it's just us. When our water's poisoned, when Michigan can't, when Flint can't get clean water, just us. Nobody else pulls up and says, "Hey, well, wait a minute." And I'm not saying other people don't support. But right. no one else, no one else is being asked to how they feel about what's happening to us. So when it's when it's something for us, I don't want to have to consider how someone else is going to be made to feel by the fact that 40 acres and a mule is now coming back to the people who never got it. Right. I don't want to I don't want to have to ask that question. I don't think it's fair that we should have to bear that emotional burden or or have that on our conscience. I don't think we should be made to to. Uh, empathize with you know feel bad about getting something that we we were stiffed on right I, no one no one else no one else does that i think uh what about the blacks that own slaves what about them I, i'm not i'm not and i don't want to split those heads either like these, these these were people who were living these were but people that's who, a good question we have descendants of those which i'm sorry to tell you that they were actually slave owners for sure. And those people had to go through Jim Crow just like everybody else. Those people got called niggas to their face just like everybody else. If the money lasted, they got redlined just like everybody else. Like, and I'm not, I don't want to split but again. Do I don't want to do they family. Get money? We, how, the how, how about, how about once we get the fun together, we figure that out, but we <laughs> figure that out. <laughs> so my position is just a little bit, uh, I understand what you're saying. So. I don't believe money is a solution. I never say money is a solution. Financial is not going to save anybody. I can give you a million dollars right now and you're still going to die. You're still going to be faced with the facts of if your spirit and your soul is right. So money is not the solution. You give the Indians the money, like you said, if they messed up spiritually, they're going to go out and get drunk. So building back the community, definitely key. But how do now, if who's in control of that? And like you said, equity, how does that benefit the direct families? Well, I mean, I, the, the theory is, and I believe that it bears out, that when you create businesses that um, you, you enrich the whole community. You can look at this barbershop. You know what they and the community that it's created in here you know through the existence or a grocery store and how important it is there's a gourmet deli across the street you know if that disappeared imagine uh, how bad it would be for this community you know because i saw what happened in bed Stuy when there was no um, you know no place to place by every business that you build uh enriches the community more, enriches everybody in the community. But we don't and own you're these doing businesses. it in an organic way. That's the next We don't own the next, these businesses. That's yeah. the next key. We, uh, we town is right. That right. so it's not owned by us. Right. right. And the, but what I'm saying is that yeah. we need to be fostering the growth of BOPs, right? Um, Black owned businesses. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what you were yeah, that's doing. What you're so we're, we're, um, we're, we're including loans and programs to, to, to kind of educate people on business and, and more of that in these communities. Right. Uh, Mentorship programs, um, micro loan programs, uh, grant program, opportunity districts where you have, you know, where there's an incentive um, uh, for outsiders to invest in black startups. Um, uh, BOB startups mm -hmm. uh, and all of, you know and all of those different mechanisms for uh, making uh, these uh, you know these communities hubs for investment and for thriving businesses. Right. And, I, and to me, that's and it, it's also sustainable because you know you're creating a sense of community. You're creating interdependent. Inter inter 
dependency in that community and uh, it benefits everybody. And it's not just handing somebody a check. It's, it's you know, it's giving, um, it's giving them, uh, you know, the knowledge, it's like, uh, you know, to use a bit bad cliche, but it's teaching a man to fish. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's more about access. It's, it's about access, access to capital and access to the knowledge to be able to, how to run a business, right? right? And, uh, and you know, that kind, of, that kind of help. And that's what, you know, we did in bed and, and it worked there. One time for the Native American folks. Just don't, yes, don't think, yeah. don't think that yeah. I don't care. One time to the Native American. One time to the Native American. He on his own. You see me in that guy outside. He's on his own. This view from under the bus is pretty nice. One time now, for the Native American. Now, no, I, think, no. I think another huge issue that we want to know your stance on is um, mass incarceration. Mass so, incarceration. I, uh, one of the questions is um, me personally being affected by mass incarceration, right? And the problem of recidivism. Right now, 13%, I mean, uh, yeah, 13% of the population in America is us, right? Is black people. And 38% of the people incarcerated are black people. So there's already a disparity there, right? Um, due to COVID, obviously that, that uh, number came down some. It was at 2 million plus at one time. Now it's about 1.3 million. Um, we're no, we no longer lead the, the world in mass incarceration. It's China now. And my question to you is, what would you do if you get into office to help quell this mass incarceration issue in America? Well, a number of things. One is I don't, um, you know, I, I don't like the privatization of the prison system. Big fat business. Yeah. Big fat. Yeah. And I think that that is, you know, that contributes to the problem. Right. Um, and it also uh, contributes to the sort of degrading conditions in those in the prison. Um, a a quarter of those prisoners, and you're right, a, a a black American committing the same crime as a white American has three times the uh, the, the chance of going to jail. Yeah. So. For the exact same crime, and the sentences are longer, and yeah. yeah, and with a much longer sentence, it's the same thing. Um, a, a quarter of those, and a quarter of the people in prison are for nonviolent drug offenses. And you know, for me, I, I'm a former drug addict, um, and uh, you know, I think we should be focusing on rehabilitation, treatment, uh, mental health help. Um, and uh, and trying to restore people to society rather than incarcerate them. Right. And so you so it would be something where you would incorporate certain programs that are programs rehabilitation, yeah, but one, right, rehabilitation when, instead of instead of the instead solitary of incarceration, instead of incarceration. Right. And uh, you know one of the things that I. That I, you know, it's kind of my Peace Corps. My uncle started the Peace Corps, and it was this kind of branded program. But I'm, I want to, I'm going to start a program uh, to create essentially um, rehabilitation farms around the country and mm. rural areas all over the country mm. where people can grow healthy food, um, where drug addicts, um, people who are convicted of nonviolent crimes, people are trying to improve their lives, recover from some kind of addiction or, or you know, SSRIs. We've got an entire generation that is now on these, you know, psychiatric drugs. Right. And it's very hard to get off in, yeah. if, if you're not in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. And I've, um, you know, I've had a lot of experience. I, and I visited a, this, this place in, um, this, in Italy where I had a family member go, which is, uh, and actually Kanye went over there at one point. Uh, with with my daughter, um, but it's a it's a farm. It has two thousand people, kids living on it who are recovering, who are you know, who are going to go to prison or whatever. They they have a vineyard. They grow organic, high quality food. They're not allowed to have cell phones, screens of any kind. Yeah. Um, but it's a it's this it, it's it, and they. Um, 
and they uh, there's a whole bunch of different industries there. They have a furniture uh, factory, they have an upholstery factory, they have uh, they make uh, very very high quality um, uh, purses for De, De La Valley, for mm. Gucci, for others, and um, and they made, they have a bakery with some of the most famous bread in in, uh, in Italy, mm. and. People go there and they make a commitment to go there for a couple of years and they come mm. out and they're recovered and mm. they go, go back, you know, they can go back and, and, um, and have lives where they can now start contributing and paying taxes and it's all free. Mm. And I think we need to pay, you know, there's so much of many of your youth, we got 106,000 kids dying every year in fentanyl. The addiction epidemic that you know started with oxycodone and now is you know being fueled by the, the, the fentanyl epidemic yeah. uh, is killing our young people, and we need to go back and rescue them. And mm -hmm. uh, and and the answer is not sending them to prison because if you're a drug addict, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna commit a crime. Right. Mm -hmm. you, it's just, it's eventually going to happen. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, and then you're going to end up in prison and your life is ruined. Now, so and, what about those that have to go to prison, right? So I, I hear you speaking specifically about non-violent offenders, right? And them be, being rehabilitated. The people that do have to go to prison for violent crimes or whatever it is, um, what do you see that can happen in these institutions that can rehabilitate them instead of it being restorative? Well, I mean, I think, think you know, I'm gonna have only have control of the federal prisons. Okay. My father had control of the federal prisons mm -hmm. and he implemented a lot of different reforms in the federal prisons for the, the federal prisons, by the way, and I was in federal prison. Right. I was in maximum security prison, you know, um, and, uh, and I've been in many state prisons, and the federal prisons are a lot better than the state prisons. Yeah, that's so I've heard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I never made it there. <laughs> we we so can't read the past that. You was in yeah, prison? I was, I was going there right yeah, after. We, no. we, we breezed past that, right? Yeah. You laughed Yeah, right. I was in prison for uh, the summer of 2001. Actually, oh yeah, you did say that. Oh wait, no, you said that. Yeah, he told us that. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he told us that, yeah, but we yeah. didn't touch on it. Yeah, an inmate. No, my, I wanted to. I, there was 140 men on my cell block. Can you move? 60 of them were political prisoners. I was in there, um, and uh, I was in solitary confinement for four days, which you know was not fun. And then you know I was in population for the rest of the time, and uh, and I actually had a good time. <laughs> People knew who you were? Yeah, I knew who I was. <laughs> it, was the, it was a break, right? It was the most relaxing break. summer. Yeah. Was, and nobody was calling me on the telephone. I didn't have to make a decision. Wow. My wife had a baby while I was in there. That's and, uh, mm. You know, that's a lot of work if, you, if your wife's having a baby. Yeah. But I didn't. Um, but I, they, I, I saw my son for the first time when they brought it. Uh, um, him to me on, on visiting day. Mm. I played basketball every day. Mm -hmm. I did. I wrote, read a lot of books that I had been sitting on my shelf. You couldn't take get the books. I had to tear the covers off the books because you couldn't have books on covers because people can make shivs with them. Right. Yeah, hard copies. Well, yeah. I would say you hard must copy. definitely hard not copy. be a part of the day because there's no way they would have let day stay. So yeah. he must not be a part of the day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because they, they can make yeah. a phone call and, you know. <laughs> like uh, hold on a second. Kids, don't listen to the presidential yeah. candidate. Going to jail is not fun. No, it's <laughs> not fun at all. <laughs> Stop putting that out. Yeah. My thing, the reason, the reason why I ask you these questions, just to circle back real quick, is because I was in state prison, and I know a lot of people where, have been where in state were prison. You? In New York State. I was where, in Fishkill. Which, oh, Fishkill. Fishkill New York, yeah, in I've New been York. in that prison many times. Really? Yeah, because visit, were you? Though, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend who was in there. Were you? Were you the one on the south side of the highway or the north side? I was on the north side, so you know it's like two okay, jails yeah, in one. So I, I was up the hill one. and down the hill. Yeah, the, the old one, that old Victorian jail. That's yeah, the, that's yeah, still there. That's the one I've been to. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I never went, but I had when I first went to work for Riverkeeper. The uh, somebody had given us a. Um, a farmhouse up in the Hudson Valley 
that was owned by the Department of Environmental Conservation, and they said, okay, you guys can use that as your office, uh, but you have to fix it up. And they said, well, we'll give you some prisoners. And I was put in charge of, of the, the prisoners. The outside clearance guards. What? The outside clearance. Yeah, and so they the came, they, you know, they had, there was guards there with guns. Mm -hmm. But I was telling them what to do. And mm -hmm. one, one day, one of them escaped. Oh, shit. Hmm. And he went down to the railroad track, and then he walked all the way to Brooklyn on the way. railroad track. It was about 40 miles. <laughs> God, 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 God. Yeah. And then his father got him and tied him to the bed. And they came back and picked him up. This was wow. What year was this? Wow. This was like in 80, uh, oh, okay. 84. All right. And um, I had them. They what? I was supposed to uh, paint a barn. Mm. But um, and they painted it up to about seven feet, but they didn't want to go up on the ladder. None of them wanted to climb the ladder, <laughs> so I, I had to paint the upper part of the barn myself. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so they, uh, no, I, I get where you're coming from. These were some of your friends in Fishkill. <laughs> is this some of them? No, they, these were some of your guys. They were all oh, from. They were all from. Yeah, the, but I was like two years old. When, yeah. When you was, when you <laughs> 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 He's not as old as I. Am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely not, but. The reason I ask these questions, um, and specifically for the, the state institutions ac across the country, is because what I realize when you get your education in prison, it changes the mindset, right? I'm yeah. someone who was a recidivist who constantly went in and out most of my life more than being out in the free world. And once I got my education, I got a bachelor's degree because it was an opportunity uh, available to me. It changed my way of thinking. Yeah. And now not only myself, but a plethora of men and women who do it, they're not going back. So my, my question to you is, is that something that you think you can institute as a, a, a foundation in these state prison systems in order for people to be paroled? Like you have to get an associate if you want to be paroled. Or yeah, I mean, like I that. don't know how I would do that with that. We, I would, well, certainly, and that's an inspiring story and really yeah. a very convincing story. And I'm certainly, and my father devoted himself to that. In fact, when he died, I have a friend um, who's in a 12-step program with me when I first came in, and he was a prisoner in Sing Sing in Austin. Mm -hmm. And he said that the day my father died, that they all wore, um, that he had been an Attica at that point. He had, and they all wore, he was, um, they all wore, a lot of the prisoners wore, black armbands because of the, you know, care that my father had taken to try to provide those kind of opportunities to mm -hmm. people in prisons across the country. It's something that I want to do. It clearly is uh, cost efficient. Mm -hmm. If we're educating people and stopping recidivism, what better outcome can you have? Exactly. Uh, that, you know, is an inspiring story. If I do get elected, I want you to, you know, call me up and hold me to I'm that. I'm ready promise. to lobby yeah. for that, man. Uh, Seriously, I'm ready to lobby. I'm going to give you my cell phone and. Well, uh, I got a job. That's right. right. <laughs> there we go. What did you get your degree in? Uh, liberal arts. I'm a bachelor's degree. But there's not arts. a lot of money in that, is there? I'm not in that lane at all. But the great thing about getting an education there is because it helped me with critical Thank analysis you. skills. It helped me be a better writer. It helped me see things way differently in the free world and inside. Yeah. It helped me build businesses. Story. So it wasn't so much for the actual liberal arts degree. It was more so for the skills. He actually helped to build a business while he was inside. Yeah. That's flourishing now. Yeah. Yeah. He still while services people inside. who are in business. A uh, publication business, uh, a social media magazine for uh, prisoners. That's great. Yeah, and it's yeah. like all over the country now. And all well, the what is it called? <laughs> now you gotta tell. Uh, why it's called YKTV magazine. YKTV. Uh, it's an yes. acronym for you know the, the vibes. vibes. You know yeah. the vibes. Yeah. Yeah. I, know. I, know. I, know. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's what it's called. It's an informational tool for incarcerated individuals to stay in tune with the times, learn about laws that are changing, you know, look at some girls too. Um comedy. Exclusive interviews, a lot of stuff that comes. I've from, been on the cover. Yeah, he's been on the cover. <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of the guests that come here, we take those interviews, we put them in the magazine, so that way they can be informed on what's on what's going on with some of their favorite celebrities and politicians. 
Yeah. I've advertised he, in it. It's great. He's advertised in yeah. it as well. Super yeah. great. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, 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 you you've <coughs> talked about your addiction issues. Uh, I've never, the, the only presidential hopeful I've ever heard admit that he used any kind of barbiturate was Bill Clinton talking about smoking weed and he didn't inhale. But you're, yeah. you're I inhaled for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's partly what I'm talking about. Like you're very open about the fact that this is a part of your history. And before the interview really kicked off, you talked about having a whole yes. Yes. in your soul that you felt like, shout out to Aerosmith, that you felt like you couldn't fill. Yeah. Is that what caused you to? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, you know, I've been going to 12-step meetings. For, I've probably been to, I don't know, 20,000 of them. So mm -hmm. I, you hear people's stories, and there's a high percentage of people like me who believe they were born with the addiction. And then there's other people who think that they got it later on in life that they'd cross the line and once you you know they say once you become a uh if you're a cucumber once you become a pickle you can't become a cucumber again mm -hmm. that once you cross this certain line you, you then you know you can't go back for me i felt that um that kind of gnawing empty hole from when i was a little kid mm -hmm. And uh, when I, um, you know, the first time I took the pledge, like you did, because you were you were saying at the beginning of the, you know, before we started, right. I think you had made this pledge to your dad about, mm -hmm. um, right. and that your dad, uh, and your dad said, when you, whenever you first do it, you do it with me, and then mm -hmm. when your dad died, you didn't do it, which I'm so, you know, incredibly impressed. Well. In the Irish Catholic communities that I grew up in, uh, there was uh, you, there was a tradition of taking the pledge, which mm -hmm. is I will never drink because it was known that our race is disproportionately impacted by um, out, particularly alcohol addiction. It's got we call it the Irish flu. Mm -hmm. Oh, and and they would give you in Catholic school they would give you a pledge pin. You would wear on your collar, and it was. I took the pledge. I'm never going to drink for my whole life. <clears throat> Very common in Ireland too, and I did that, um, and I took it seriously. And when my, you know, my father died when I was 14, and by the time I was 15, I hadn't even never even tasted coffee. Mm. And that summer, I went to a um, a, uh, a party. Uh, of the elder brother, this is when I was living in Cape Cod, the elder brother of a friend of mine was, uh, had been drafted and was going to Vietnam. And there was a going away party for him. And uh, he didn't want to go. Mm. And at the party, there was a melee, and he ended up hitting a cop and going to jail. And he didn't go to Vietnam. But I was hitchhiking home from that party and an older boy picked me up, who I knew, but not well. And he offered me LSD. And LSD had come to that town that night. This was in 1969. So, um, and I wouldn't have taken it, but there was, that, there was a comic book. Okay, I would, we read, there was a little store, the only store in our town was a news store. It sold ice cream, candy, and then the comics. And the comics would come every Tuesday. And my favorite comic was a comic called Turok Son of Stone, which was about <coughs> these two Indians. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you're nodding your head. I can't even believe that you've heard of it. But Turok. Yeah, I've yeah. definitely heard of Turok. Tur Turok, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's not Tupac, it's Turok. Turok. <laughs> <laughs> I know Torak, man. I know Torak. <laughs> okay, that was a good one. That's my nickname, oh. Torak. Yeah. So anyway, the, the, the week before, there was an episode where the Indians had eaten like peyote or mm. something, and they had had hallucinations. They'd seen dinosaurs. They were like, it was like they had gotten transported back in time. Time, mm. yeah. And, uh, and so when this guy offered it to me, I said, I had an interest in paleontology when I was little. And I said, if I eat that, oh, I see dinosaurs. And he said, you might. <laughs> and, I, and so I took it. Right. And I had this, you know, incredibly vivid hallucinations. And then in the morning, 
you know, it lasted all night, and you know, and I got in trouble. A lot of people in the town took it that night, and I, um, <laughs> and I was walking home from the town about three miles in the morning, but I was crashing on the drug, and I was getting depressed and remorseful and telling myself, I'm never going to do this again. I did something that was wrong. And I, uh, I, got, I got near my, and I had to go home and face the music because I had violated my curfew, and my mother was, you know, invented tough love, mm -hmm. uh, and I was going to get in a lot of trouble. And she, and I, um, I saw these boys in the woods, <clears throat> and, uh, and I went in to see what they were doing, and I told them, and uh, they, they saw me, and I said, I'm really crashing on this stuff. And they said, try some of this. And it was, and it, I'd been saying to myself, I'm never going to take a drug again. And they offered me a line of crystal meth. And I snorted it, and I felt great. And that was really the template for my addiction for the next 14 years. Of How me, long? Me, 14? 14 years. Mm -hmm. I, I got sober when I was 28. Mm -hmm. and, but I'm constantly um, saying I'm not going to do this again and then not being able to keep promises to myself. And that, um, you know, I had iron willpower in other parts of my life. Like I gave up candy for Lent when I was 13. I never ate candy again. Hmm. So I was in college, and I I gave up desserts the next year, and I um, I never ate another dessert till I was in college, and I was playing rugby at college and was trying to bulk up, so I started eating desserts again. But I felt like I could do anything with my willpower, but somehow I, it was impervious to the, the addiction. Mm -hmm. It just didn't work against it. I was cunning, baffling. Powerful and the most demoralizing part of addiction is not being able to keep contracts with yourself. Mm -hmm. Of telling yourself, I'm going to do this and then doing it, or I'm not going to do that. And then, you know, four hours later, and believing earnestly, sincerely, honestly, mm -hmm. I'm not going to ever do that again. And four hours later, you're doing it and you don't know how it happened. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, uh, you know, it's really demoralizing. What snatched you out of it? Well, then I got so I my progression was very fast. Addiction <coughs> is always progressive; it always gets worse. And I, my drug of choice was heroin. So within four weeks of that, I was shooting heroin. Mm. Mm. And I I had been around you know animals my whole life and and given them hypodermic needles, and it made sense to me, um, you know, that it would be more efficient to uh, to inject the drug. So I I. You know, I did that, and I was addicted for until I was 28 years old, and then I got sober. I was trying the whole time. I just didn't know how to do it. And I would go for weeks. I would go for months. What was the difference in 28? And, well, I got into a 12-step program, mm -hmm. and then and I had a spiritual awakening, and it was like it was lifted. So, and it you know it was it was like a miracle, as much a miracle for me as if I'd been able to walk on water, because I had tried, really tried. <laughs> in every way and could not do it on my own. And then I did that, you know, the 12 step programs are designed to induce a spiritual awakening, a, a, a profound spiritual realignment. And, uh, and I had that very, very quickly in the program. And as soon as I committed myself, it happened to me. And I, and you know, it just disappeared. Did you go willingly to the 12 step program or somebody Oh, I was, you to go? no. What happened is I got arrested, mm. and I got arrested on an airplane. Um, somebody saw me going in the bathroom. I was actually on my way to a rehab, but before I went to the oh, rehab, damn. I stopped on 106th Street mm -hmm. to cop, and then I went out to LaGuardia, and I was flying out to the rehab in, in, uh, in Minnesota. But I, you know, I got one last one before going, and right. somebody saw me on the airplane going to the bathroom with it. And when I landed, and when I landed, the police arrested me. Right. But what I, it was a good thing for me because I could, because of my name, because of my notoriety, I could have never gone into a meeting and, you know, and and and, and, and spoken truthfully about my life hmm. because I was guarded. You know, and I, I'd been, you know, raised in a family where if you talked about stuff publicly, it would, you know, it would be damage. in the papers. Yeah. 
And so it was an impossible situation. But as soon as that happened, there was nothing to hide anymore. And I was able to go to these meetings and get, you know, and talk honestly. And, um, and so it was like a gift for me. The arrest I knew was, was probably the greatest gift I got because it gave me then access to the 12 step programs and to the arrest, you know, the spiritual awakening. Yeah. And I want to ask, what was the spiritual awakening if you don't mind us asking? Well, I'll tell you what happened is that I, I knew, you know, I had been struggling all of this time to quit, right? And, um, so, and I didn't want to be my life to be that, okay, I'm going to quit, but I'm going to be white knuckling it the whole time and thinking about it and stuff. I, I was like, how do I, how do I just become a different person who some, a person who never thinks about it, hmm. like a normal person. Wow. And I knew I had read the lives of the saints, you know, St. Augustine had been an alcoholic and then. He had a spiritual awakening and walked away St. Francis of Assisi. So I knew it happened to other people. I had a friend my, who, who was best friends with my brother. I had two brothers who died of this, <coughs> this disease of, of addiction or addiction related um, uh, deaths. One of them, you know, skied into a tree. Um, but but the, this guy was a friend, really close friend of my brother's, and he used to take drugs with us. He'd take them with the same fanaticism that I had, the same compulsion, the same impulse that was uncontrollable. And then he joined the Unification Church and be, became a Mooney. Right? Do you guys know what that is? No. no. It's, a, it's like a cult. It's like, uh, there's a Korean guy called Reverend Sun Young Moon. Oh, I've heard of that. Yeah. I've heard of him. Yeah. yeah, and and he has a lot of followers, and this guy joined it, and he had a spiritual awakening, and he didn't want to take drugs anymore, and he would be with us, and I'd be taking drugs in front of him, but he didn't want them. And I used to think about this guy, you know, when I when I was after, you know, I got arrested, and I knew that I I had to get sober. I would think about this guy, and I would say to myself, I'd rather be dead than be a loony. But I wish that I could get whatever it was, distill whatever it was that allowed him to be impervious to this impulse without becoming a religious nuisance, right. you know, <laughs> or a, like a cult member yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. right. and, um, and then I, I picked up a book by Carl Jung that was just sitting on the on the you know, on a table somewhere, and it was called synchronicity. Synchronicity. And the word synchronicity means, it means coincidence, kind of. It's like, it's the kind of coincidence that happens if you're, if you're talking about somebody that you haven't thought about in 20 years. And they show up. And they, they, yeah, they, they show up, and the phone rings, and it's that guy on the phone. Right. And that's synchronicity. Well, Carl Jung was, and the reason I picked that, that book up is because there was an album by the police at that time by the same name. I didn't know what the word meant. Mm -hmm. I started reading it, and Jung was the one of the fathers of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. He was a um, Sigmund Freud was his mentor, yep. but Freud was an atheist, and Jung was a deeply spiritual man. He had these incredible spiritual experiences starting when he was three or four years old. Very authentic experiences, and is form of psychiatry is very connected to spiritual transformations. And he had had a, um, he had this experience one where, where he was sitting in the third floor of his, uh, of his sanitarium. He, he ran the biggest sanitarium in Europe. He was up on the third floor and he's and a, with a patient, it was a woman, and she's talking to him and she's talking about a dream. And he was very much, um, you know, his, his style therapy is very oriented towards dream interpretation. Right. She was telling him about this dream, and the, the fulcrum of that dream was a scarab beetle, which is a creature that is, uh, it's a piece of iconography on the, on the hieroglyphics in, right. in Egypt and on the obelisk, the tombs. It really doesn't exist in Northern Europe, right. where he was. So he's hearing 
while he's talking to this woman, he's hearing this bing, 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 bing on the window behind him. And he doesn't want to turn and take his attention away from his patient. But finally, he gets exasperated and he swings around and he throws open the window and a scarab yeah, beetle flies, flies in, lands in his palm. Wow. And he turns and he shows it to the woman. He says, this is what you were dreaming about. And she goes, yeah. So he, th he wow. thought these little incidents of synchronicity are, are God's way of cutting through the rules and regulations that God has set up, like the rules of mathematics and nature and physics. Right. And every once in a while, he breaks his own rules and comes in and, and taps you on the shoulder. Mm. And, you know, because the, the chance of that happening are one in a trillion. In a trillion. It yeah. never happened, right? But, but it seems so obvious, like, <laughs> yeah. you just said it and this happened. Yeah. It has to be connected. It has to be connected. Yeah. And, and scar he said, scarabs, I believe, they represent new life. Yeah, but, but they, they, have, they have all this kind of spiritual significance, right? right? But um, he but he had this, uh, so he then tried to reproduce that in a clinical setting. So he would put one guy in one room and the other guy in another room, and he'd have them flip cards, and then guess what the other guy flipped. And he thought that if he could, if he could beat the laws of chance, beat the laws of, of nature, the natural law, he would have proven the existence of a super of a supernatural, of mm -hmm. some force that was not explained by natural law, right. by the laws of mathematics or chance or whatever. Mm -hmm. But he's never able to do that. Mm -hmm. So in this book he says, I can't prove the existence of a God using empirical tools or scientific tools, but he said, having seen tens of thousands of patients come through his hospital, I can prove that people who believe in God get better faster and that their recovery is more enduring than people who don't. Hmm. Oh, in that sense, it's irrelevant if there's a God up there. If you believe in one, your chance of living a happy life are better. Right. That's what he was saying. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was really significant for me. At that time, it was much more significant than if, if he had said, I proved the existence of a God, which I wouldn't have believed. But him saying that I can improve your chance, I can improve my chances of recovering, of never having to take this drug again, if I believe in God. I said, okay, I'm gonna do it. So then I had the problem of how do you start, how do you start, um, believing in something that you can't see or smell or touch or feel or acquire with your senses, right? And he gives the solution. You fake it till you make it. You act as if. And, um, and so that's what I did. I started saying, okay, I'm just going to act as if there's a God up there watching me all the time and life is just a series of tests and that I have to behave myself even when I don't have an audience. I have to do the right thing, Integrity. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, and so, you know, and, uh, and, I, and every day is broken down into like 40 little choices and each one for me now has a moral implication. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I wake up in the morning, um, the alarm goes off, you know, do I lie in bed for an extra 15 minutes with my indolent pornographic thoughts or do I get jumped right out of the And then uh, when I go, do I brush my teeth? Do I hang up the towels? Where, you know, when they, do I make the bed? That's the most important decision every day. Yes, you start yes, out making yes, the bed. Yes. Do I put the water in the ice tray before I put the ice tray back in the freezer, right? Do I, when I reach into my closet and pull out a pair of blue jeans and all those little wire hangers fall on the floor, do I actually go and hang them back up or do I say, you know, that's somebody else's job. I'm too much of a big shot for that job, right? Uh -huh. Do I put the shopping cart where the shopping cart is supposed to go, you know, when, when I, or do I leave it in the middle of the parking lot like everybody else does? <laughs> <laughs> and I, had, I had this experience when I was, when I first got sober, and my life had gotten very small through addiction, and it started getting big very quickly when I, you know, when I got sober. And I was running through National Airport, and I was at, there was a plane that I was going to miss, and it was mission critical that I got on that airplane. I had to get on it. You know, I would have been late for the appointment, and it was, it was, it was a whole bunch of consequences that would have happened. So I had to get that plane, and I was going to miss it. And I'm running through the airport, 
and I put a, a stick of dentine in my mouth, and I, I'm rolling up the, the wrapper, and as I'm running, I, I threw the wrapper into a garbage can, and it, went, it did a perfect arc, swish right in the middle. <laughs> but Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> but out of the corner of my eye, I saw it must have hit something in there because it jumped back out and landed oh. on the ground. But I was like, that, that's God's fault because I made the show. <laughs> <laughs> so I was running, running, trying to get the plane, but it, then it just started eating at me. And I got about 50 feet down. And I went, God, I got to go back, go back and, pick it up. and pick it up. But that, you know, I ended up making the plane, but that to me was probably the most important thing I did that day because that's, mm. you know, maintaining that posture of surrender. When your life is broken and everything's going wrong, it's easy to be, you know, in surrender to God. But when all the cash and prizes start flowing back in, you know, my inclination is to say, okay, thanks, God, I got it from here. And I take the wheel and drive the car off the cliff again. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But I'll, I'll tell you the answer to your question very quickly of what happened to me. The day that I finished reading that book, um, Synchronicity, I went out to play volleyball. And, um, you know, so the synchronicity is about all these coincidences, and I go out to play volleyball, and they, somebody hits the volleyball in this very powerful, uh, you know, hit at, where, where it went up on a kind of an errant flight, and it comes down and it hits the top of the post. And as it's going up again, I said out loud, that ball is going to get hit by a Mack truck. I said it. I don't know why I said it, but I said it. And everybody heard me say it. And then the ball went up again, it came down, and it hit the top of a chain link fence, and it dropped on the other side, and then it rolled down this driveway for about, I don't know, 50 or 60 feet, out into the middle of a, of a little highway, and a big 18-wheeler with a bulldog on the front comes and pops it, you know, bang, pop. That's crazy. <laughs> everybody says, everybody looks at me for a second like, wow, wow, how'd you know God that? Really and then they went on. But, you know, for me, it was significant because I just finished that book, book and went out and then it happened. <coughs> and, it, and it was like, OK, so uh, I'm reaching out. It was like that was a cheap, yeah. Yeah. you know, poor man's spiritual awakening. But that's what it was. You know? Right. I mean, it works. Yeah. yeah. But worse, no. real. Uh, you well, it, it, it opened me to start looking at those things and saying, you know, I should pay attention to those things when they happen instead of just dismissing them. You believe now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> now I don't have to. Now I, you know, but now I see it in you know, every day. Yeah. You know. Do you but, believe that you can change this country? Well, you know, with the way that I live my life, I keep doing the next right thing, and the results are in God's hands. So if God wants me to pre be president, I'm going to be president. I'm going to do everything I need to do to get there, but I don't have any control over the outcome. The only thing I have control over is this little piece of real estate inside of my own shoes. You know, it's the only thing I have control over, and i got to keep doing the next right thing, the next right thing. Mm. But I don't have expectations. Uh, you know, I'm an environmentalist for years. If you have expectations when you're environmentalist, your, your heart is going to be broken because right. every victory is temporary. Every defeat that you suffer is permanent. You know, when they extinguish a species, when they destroy a special place, it's never coming back. And every time you save something, it's just a new battle because somebody else wants it and they're going to pour concrete on it or pollute it. And I saw so many people just get crushed and, uh, and get broken and burn out. And so I said to myself, I'm not going to have any expectations. I'm going to fight. I'm going to get up every day, say, reporting for duty, sir. And I'm going to go out and try to save the Hudson River. Uh, but if I lose a battle, I'm not going to get defeated by it. I'm not going to have any expectations. And, and if you don't have expectations, you never get disappointed. And if you can't get disappointed, it makes you relentless because nobody can permanently defeat you. Right. You're always going to get back up and fight again. Right. Mm. And to me, I think that's where my power comes from, is that I, no matter what they do to me, I'm always going to go back 
dude, you got to get Bernie right. Sanders as your running mate, man. <laughs> you got to get Bernie Sanders. I don't know, Bernie. I'm going to kill her, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we already decided that. Right? Kill a mic in the cabinet. Yeah, Bernie right. Sanders on deck. Kill a mic. We already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for gracing the shop with Thank your presence, you very much. your inspiration, and your wisdom. Bobby Kennedy, y'all. Junior! It's hot for trap trapper turned smack rapper. Only smack rapper that you know is smack rappers. Got bars I can hang with the backpackers. Trap star, I don't hang with the backpackers. I'm in the hood with the work you heard. Making fiends leave earth you heard. To baby mama thirst you heard Feel the flow, nigga, throw it in reverse This the way you need to serve, you heard